Hello everybody, good afternoon. Welcome to the University of Malaya Star Series webinar where we speak to institutional and academic leaders shaping University of Malaya and the academic world. And today we are very fortunate to have with us today, as I mentioned earlier, a very wonderful fatherly mentoring uh, personality with us. Um, we have with us someone who will be talking about becoming a tale of academic leadership. And that person is none other, although you cannot see his face right now behind the mask, Professor Dr. Ng Kwan Hung. Uh, many of us, of course, know Prof Un. Many of us, especially those from the medical faculty, have actually had the pleasure of being mentored by Prof Un himself. But just as a way of introduction, as a formality, um, allow me to mention and introduce Professor Ng. Is of course the Merdeka Award recipient of 2020 for outstanding scholastic achievement. And earlier on before that, Prof Ng is also a recipient of the Marie Sklodowska Curie Award in 2018 for his contributions to breast cancer research and radiation medicine, education and leadership. So we definitely have someone with us who is really almost the epitome and exemplar of an academic leader. Prof Ng has also in his academic life um, and still doing so, providing a lot of extensive interdisciplinary contributions in breast cancer, biomedical imaging, radiation safety, and risk communication as well as um, COVID-19 most recently. So ladies and gentlemen, profs, doctor, Dato, everybody, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, and I would like to ask Prof, Prof Ng, can you tell us and share with us how did you become, can you share your tale of becoming an academic leader? Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. And thank you, Dr. Amira, for inviting me for this talk and also for the introduction. And as you mentioned, there'll be a tale. So I'm going to tell you stories, stories about how I become an academic leader. Okay, so let's start now. Okay. Becoming interesting. Right? We always become somebody, become a leader or whatever it is. All of us were young ones upon a time. And that was me. I can't remember how I was. Do you remember there's an old song that uh, still keep coming to my mind? I'm sure you remember that. Ke sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not our to see. Kesera, sera, whatever will be, will be. And that will tell us the future is so uncertain. But could we chart our life journey? Yes, to some extent, as I continue growing up in school, primary school and and secondary school. And then here, the picture shows I was uh, just graduate, I was teaching yeah, in a school, still young, and also started my undergraduate study at the University of Malaya, doing some experiment. Still, the, this Coursera Sera comes to my mind. What am I going to do after my graduation? What future do I have? Now that reminds me of when I was in the secondary school. It was a Methodist boys school in Kuala Lumpur, MBSKL. A chemistry teacher, Mr. Chong, was, it was something I still remember and many of my classmates remember that whatever you do, it doesn't matter, but excel in that. So be it, you'll be a teacher, a lawyer, a singer, 
a minister, whatever it is, excel. Just put your heart in that. And that is a pretty good advice for growing up kid like me. And then I continue uh, in between uh, my path to a different ways. And that was my PhD graduation, receiving my scroll from Tuan Ku uh, at the University of Malaya, can recognize the DTC. And then now is what I am today, uh, probably less hair, you can see that. Now that is more than 60 years of my life. And about 35 years are in the academia. You can compare the journey with mine and a lot of people is quite treacherous. You can see the path it is uh, not smooth path, winding, going uphill, look out for the roots. It might trip over the steps. I know this kind of terrain well. I enjoy walking in the jungle. I used to take students for jungle walk. Uh, and looking for adventure, as me, you can see in the dinosaur area, always look up. Uh, so life is such a way as you grow up, whether in academia or you might choose to be in the industry or in the business world, is very full of challenges, a lot of uncertainties, obstacles lying ahead. But nonetheless, you will succeed. Now, why did I become an academic? This uh, Snoopy is my favorite uh, cartoon. Uh, I was fooled by the job description. We always think, oh, it's good to be a lecturer. Good pay, right? long holidays, I just give lectures. Better than school teachers. <laughs> Many were drawn to that. Uh, it's interesting to look at the origin of the academia and that it's a famous philosopher, Plato, right? It started it's, uh, 385 BC. It's almost 2,400 years ago. The Academia, this is a suburb north of Athens. And you can see these learned people, these learned other philosophers, and get together, discuss. Right? And so today, you know, we have the, our PhD, Doctor of Philosophy, philosophy the knowledge and learning. Notice the center, and that guy probably. I suspect you, those days there's no pen and paper, they're just inscribing a chisel, his uh, CV, his, uh, CV tablet. <laughs> uh, that is interesting, uh, academia. Uh, we should enjoy what we are doing, uh, be very passionate in that. You look at these two pictures, this is from, uh, pick up this magazine, Economist. A uh, gardener and a miner, they were so happy, right? Today you think, oh, there are many tasks, right? Uh, don't be one. Uh, they enjoy, they, they serve the society, they do good, right? They really have enjoyed themselves. But as we uh, assume most of you are academics, uh, we are academicians, we are very fortunate because we have been paid to do what I like to do, isn't it? Like those of us enjoying doing research, on certain things, and uh, we've been paid, right? even grant money, we teach, we do research for the whole life. That is uh, fantastic to me. Right? And always, and be those, for example, in the uh, creative arts, right? the musicians, uh, poets, writers, right? they pay a full time job to do the research, that's their creative activities. So we're passionate, whatever we want to do. Now, working in academia, we all know that it's very really full of woes, frustrations, and you know, I can see, right, uh, in today's climate, is funding issue, uh, lack of fund, lack of recognition, salary is pretty low compared to the industry, the private, and teaching workload is heavy, and we have our KPI papers got rejected, uh, lot, lots of issues, it's frustrating, let alone how to become an academic leader. But I always believe and encourage or still be happy, be passionate what we do. Now, when I was young, even in undergraduate time, I always wanted to do something practical, useful to society, that's impactful. I just wanted to, what? to study. Anyway, uh, 
I took up physics as an undergraduate. I was fascinated by that. I'm a very good uh, physics teacher in school, uh, Mr. Lu. And that inspired me a lot. Uh, it's driven by curiosity. The physics is find out about the universe, about the atoms, about how things work. Then, now what do I do then? It was in the dilemma right after graduation. Oh, this is the physics knowledge. And uh, was combining with medicine, with, with healthcare. So that is uh, a medical physics. It was pretty new then, over 35 years ago, uh, in Malaysia and even in the region. Pretty new. Uh, no one have heard of it. Uh, and I remember when I did my postgraduate in uh, Scotland in Aberdeen. I came back to the uni hospital then, uh, just couldn't quit a job. Uh, there's no such uh, destination, it was unknown to them. Uh, so I ended up doing something else. I was teaching in a college for a few years. So that is the price to pay you. Going to something is just very new. And today is established. It's very much demand and it contributes a lot to medicine. Now, along the way, I have very good mentors, those who guide me. And one was Professor Tatu Taiming Lui, he uh, was a distinguished professor at the University of Malaya as well. Uh, did my PhD with her. And mind you, it's a unique uh, PhD is in the field of pathology, right? not in physics or medical <laughs> physics. It, there's no one here to guide me. Uh, along with uh, Professor David Bradley to help me as a consultant for that. And uh, all this year under her, I was still working as a scientific officer uh, in the department and the importance of integrity in doing research, the integrity, the honesty, you know, the ethics. So, so far I, I learned, I still remember uh, the advice from uh, Professor Louis. And another mentor who was uh, spending <coughs> time at the University of Wisconsin in the United States with the late Professor John Cameron. Uh, he, he was an ex inventor extraordinary. Right? You, you probably know about the bone densitometer. Right? You look for osteoporosis, particularly for women. He was one of the co-inventors of that and, and many other things. And his famous uh, advice, if anything is worth doing, it is worth doing it badly. Now he was citing from uh, G.K. Chesterton, a uh, famous British uh, writer and also is apologetic. Uh, seems contradictory, right? Why should you do things badly? What it actually meant is that it doesn't have to be perfect. Just do it, right? No, just do it. Those of you, my young one, remember, right? The Nike, right? The slogan, just do it. So, no, there's a problem with many. They hesitate, oh, let's spend more time, let's get more ground money. You keep on procrastinate, then you never get it done. So that it is uh, advice I still remember. I still impart it to my students and my mentees. In the academic world, uh, in our portfolio, right, uh, we all emphasize a lot about, oh, we are a researcher. Right? But we also should be a good teacher as well. You teach. If you don't teach, then you can't be a good researcher. And the uh, Ernest Rutherford, one of the Nobel laureate in physics, is once said, "A scientist who can't explain his theories to a barmaid doesn't really understand them. The barmaid is going to a lay person, you know, talking uh, someone who uh, hasn't gone to uh, university, right?" Like the person. Uh, so we have all the fantastic theories we learn. Right? We can't put it to a level, explain to our uh, neighbors, people in the street, then uh, we don't really understand that. So that is important to bring you know, our knowledge in the universities regarded as Ivory Tower to the people, to the community. After all, uh, our research fund, even most of us are funded uh, by the taxpayer money. So, so I my interest in education training and I, I started the, the Master of Medical Physics program right then, it was new then, uh, almost 22 years now. Uh, and then 
that is not remember my teacher even excel right uh, make a difference not just another master program and i work very hard uh, get this accreditation from the ipm the institute of physics and engineering in Masson, uh since 2002 until today right we have re-accreditation successfully and that is the only program outside UK and Ireland that's so accredited. It's a prestigious program. We benchmark with those at the universities in the UK. And UK has been one of the pioneers, extremely high level in medical physics. But that also comes with uh, a lot of sacrifices. I, I was the uh, only one uh, running the show. It's a, one man show, a good view of people uh, from US, Wisconsin, uh, and from UK to help me to do. Now, that remember 20 years ago, right? And we started using e learning. Right? Uh, we've gone back a long way. So we do this tele teaching from US, from Australia to help me uh, to boost up the, the teaching quality. So we did a lot of courage in that. Right? And also the conviction that oh, it will succeed, and then uh, the confidence with this help, but uh, sacrifice, great sacrifice. I uh, uh, forgo my sabbaticals. I ask to stay back. I if I leave, then they have to close it, and then it's hard to revive. So uh, I serve under very good deans, and uh, one of them uh, and the VC, uh, Prof. Anna Zaini. Uh, I mean, so all these were very, very supportive. And then I could recruit uh, the junior one, they were sent uh, to the UK, to Australia for the PhD. So while waiting for them to come back, I was holding the fort, so to speak. So that is a, a great challenge uh, to see how it remains uh, such a very high standing. We attracted a lot of international students and more and more and will be a regional center of excellency. So that is the education. Along the way, I made the coursework of 100 over uh, master students, then the project to me, but I'm very proud of my PhD graduates. Uh, the bottom three are ongoing. Uh, most of them are from the physics engineering background, some are radiographers background. Uh, do you notice anything uh, special of my PhD students. The only one male student. And it's not Malaysian, it's from Iran. <laughs> Safari did very well, it's in Germany now. Oh, so mostly uh, uh, girls. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's quite interesting. Uh, and the last one, the right is um, from China, is went back to China. And one, Rosalind, is did in RISCOM uh, from the social sciences. So I do venture beyond the physics engineering but into uh, other fields as well. Now, this is interesting. Uh, also interested to mentor beside the PhD and master, those young ones who approached me for advice and help. And that uh, started the global mentoring program. And let's listen uh, to this. This is from the physics world, uh, the audio uh, recording. And that will best describe what this mentoring program is all about.
uh, my apologies, everybody. I just realized that um, you're not able to actually hear the um, the audio. So let me, if I can just try again. A couple, uh, let me just stop sharing, and then we will start sharing again, and hopefully that will help with the audio. Apologies for this prof. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry to everybody watching. Um, a lot of things that we just don't expect sometimes. Hi, Hamish. Now, Tammy, you've been looking into mentoring this week and specifically a global mentoring scheme for early career medical physicists. C can you tell us a bit more about this program? Okay, so this is a global mentoring program set up by Quan Hung Ng, who's a medical physicist at the University of Malaya. Now, medical physics has got its own really specific challenges because it bridges both science and healthcare environments. So the trainees have got to learn to work and research and interact with many different types of professionals in a complex hospital environment. So Ng hoped that the mentoring scheme could provide young medical physicists with guidance and support to help them progress their career, and in particular, to help them develop leadership skills. And, and, and so how does the mentoring scheme work? What, what's special about this particular scheme? Okay, so they set it up so there was one permanent mentor, plus additional mentors from various countries and institutions who took part in discussions and provided advice. The initial group of mentees was made up of 16 people. So this is medical physicists, postgraduate students, plus an early career researcher from countries in Latin America and Asia. And then to establish relationships between the mentors and the mentees from all these different places and countries, the program used e-mentoring, which is basically video meetings, online group conference calls. So basically the things we're all using now. But um, this approach is, is particularly useful to support people in developing countries, perhaps where medical physics is just starting up and there's a lack of experienced people to guide these early career medical physicists. And, and, and so how did it go? Is the, is the program a success? Yeah, so um, the program started in 2017 and ran until this year. And then the team has just published a research paper documenting their experiences. So. At the end of the program, all of the mentees were asked to fill in an online survey and um, over 80 percent of them said the program had had a positive impact on their personal and professional lives and said they gained knowledge and skills from mentors. So um, some of the positive aspects that they um, described included things like increased self-confidence and less anxiety about moving to new career stages. Uh, learning to handle international meetings, improving leadership skills, and gaining a, a global view of medical physics. Um, it also gave them a way to seek professional advice and learn from each other, with over half of the mentees formed research collaborations with themselves and the mentors, for example, publishing work together. Um, overall, the conclusion was they definitely recommended that mentoring should be implemented as an extracurricular activity wherever possible. Wow, that, that sounds really useful both for, for the mentor and the mentee. It, is the scheme continuing? Yeah, definitely. So the team um, plans to expand and diversify the group with um, getting medical physicists from other continents to join in. So um, they're looking at people from Africa and from Europe. And what was interesting was that most of the mentees, so over 80%, said that they had a goal of becoming a future leader and they wanted to carry on participating in the program. So perhaps it will be self-perpetuating with mentees turning into mentors and helping to coordinate activities in the future. Wow, that, that sounds like a fantastic program. Um, you can read more about this um, in an article that Tammy has written for the Physics World website.
Okay, that gives a pretty good description of this uh, global mentoring program that I started. Uh, it is mentees from Latin America, you know, from Africa, Europe, and majority from Asia. And I encounter the first batch, like the, I was in the Inicia Sao Paulo in, in Brazil, uh, teaching then, I got some of them involved. Uh, also, the regional meetings in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the Indonesian students and uh, other countries uh, they were excited about this program. So you can see it's from we mentor the mentees, they themselves go mentor the new mentees. This is how we train the future leaders, not only in the specific in medical physics, but also in general. And for example, uh, in two weeks' time, we have one session on conflict resolution, and this is very much needed uh, in workplace, in anywhere else. And the very important message, I always believe, it is uh, from this little prince, uh, from Antoine Song Asbury. As for the future, your task is not to foresee, but to enable it, to do it. Remember John Cameron, so just, just do it. Right, to enable, to make sure they happen, not just fold our hands and say, oh, wait, uh, let's see what's happening, where it will take me, right? but we just go for that. And this uh, discipline is, is marvelous, I mean, uh, translated to so many languages. Let book encourage you, if you uh, have read it, uh, recommend it to your students, they will benefit from that. Let's talk slightly about my research. Now, medical physics is about applying the physics engineering principles in, in medicine, like those uh, CT scan, MRI, ultrasound, right? also radiotherapy, nuclear medicine, and many. And these are the, the core areas we are proficient in. Uh, we work along with radiologists, oncologists, nuclear medicine physicians, surgeons, and practically various aspects, various disciplines in medicine. Now, I have an interest in breast cancer. Recall Prof. Louis, right, a uh, pathologist, uh, my PhD mentor, supervisor, and was working with her on breast cancer, uh, early detection. We look at the tissue and we look at the, the mammogram. Uh, you can see that uh, it started in, in diagnosis, right, a mammogram, uh, early diagnosis of breast cancer. And uh, in medicine, it's just not diagnosis, it, early. It, it, and prevent, you can predict. So some of my research are moving in that direction, as well as moving the other direction of you know, in therapy, in prognosis, in monitoring uh, that particular disease. Now, though my main areas in breast cancer, but nonetheless, like the, I also have branch off to other aspects uh, in, uh, in the kidney, uh, in the, recently we started one with uh, thalassemia and different aspects of it. And this is one of uh, my uh, very proud of this paper from Lancet Oncology, highly prized journal, uh, talking about the standardization of clinical breast density measurement uh, along with uh, two uh, breast surgeons. And then another one, uh, in medical physics is my profession, the creme de la creme talk. And is invited to write this vision 2020. Uh, you have to be a leader in your field, a visionary, so to chart the path, right, where will this breast density lead to? By the way, the breast density just indicates the amount of the tissue that are likely to develop into breast cancer in the breast. So it's just ways to estimate uh, as accurate as possible and relate with uh, the status person. So, uh, and also its clinical significance, whether could it be used for to predict uh, any additional risk to breast cancer. So this is another, uh, my uh, humble achievement in this area. So that was the research and I came up, it is also people could it, because breast density can be altered, Breast destiny can be altered to can change the destiny of the breast. Now, there are some ways you can like our lifestyles, our diet, 
uh, we can change the density. So the higher density, the higher risk. Let's just briefly, right? So if one has high density, we can modify, we can change it. Uh, of course, there are some uh, chemotropic agents as well, but that's what you can do from a sedentary lifestyle to one more, more active exercise and proper diet and others could uh, change that. So that is uh, a lot of research uh, in this area. Now, we need to work together with other people. Research is where we, we label uh, together, collaborate, come together, laborate, label, the Latin, collaborate, label, work together. So these are my international collaborators uh, uh, across the whole globe, down south from uh, New Zealand, Australia, and in North America. Uh, some, there are, uh, University of Malaya, uh, professors and uh, my colleagues. Uh, it's an amazing team of people I work with. Uh, it is fun to work with them. And these are some of the, the more uh, recent uh, team members. Probably can recognize some of them. See, I have a cross over from medical physics in medicine like, to like uh, Danny Wong in the social sciences. Because uh, you have here uh, the David Young, uh, linguistic and the I did in biomedical engineering uh, and uh, various people, uh, my collaborators. So I also like to thank them uh, for working with me uh, all those years. And we have produced pretty good uh, results, good papers, have fun in that and presentation. Most of the thing we hope the work that we do have impact on the society is just more than publishing it in a journal. Uh, these are the you can see the, the countries where my the team is a team effort uh, in different research areas I'm doing from uh, different parts of the world literally across right from down south uh, down in Australia New Zealand down to North America and those countries in between and uh, I, I learned a lot from them the different culture different style of doing things and you would not that straightforward as well, a lot of challenges. Uh, sometimes you just pull the hair out, less hair now, perhaps. <laughs> uh, some didn't work out right, uh, for various reasons, but that, that is the way about research, right? You you search and search, right? You search, search for people who work with you of the same interest, and we, we search for the truth, right? What is there, right? So, uh, and my collaboration continue and uh, Halfway to the COVID, thinking why not we chronicle what we have gone through, what we have contributed, the innovation that as a physicist in the whole world. Uh, so I round up quite a lot of people, uh, land up with this book, which was launched March 18 recently. Uh, 91 contributors from 39 countries. It's amazing. Uh, we have uh, my co-editor, uh, Professor. Madalena Stova, so we have to really coordinate working with uh, people uh, from all the world. And we also fairly geographical balance and also gender balance, 36% are female uh, authors. So we look at our clinical practice, how it affected us, how we overcome that, and then uh, education, we move on to the e-learning mode, and also how we continue to do some research to some extent, right? We're limited, uh, restricted to the labs and to the hospitals as well. So look at the very proud, my collaborators, uh, the authors come from those uh, countries uh, highlighted in blue, 39 countries. So in a way, uh, we promote the solidarity and understanding right, of the, how we can work towards a common good uh, for humankind. We put our uh, resources, our thoughts together. So this book will serve as a very good uh, document uh, for the world to learn uh, from. And uh, perhaps all these various stories and my experience to tell you that uh, a true leader brings 
people together. Uh, you can see this cartoon illustrate you know, the people with all disparate different ways. Right? You can bring them together, working towards a common good uh, for humanity. And uh, on the research collaboration, I also was active in organization and I was the founding president of the C form, the Southeast Asian Federation of Medical Physics. And that was the founding fathers and mothers. We took a picture in 2003 in Bangkok. Uh, but uh, the organization was formed uh, three years earlier. And also in 2014, got a group of people, we started this ACOM, the ASEAN, the College of Medical Physics. It is a, a college and institute uh, for training, for learning. So uh, continue to work on that. And also I was one of the founding uh, members of the AFOM, the Asia Oceania Federation Medical Physics, right? the, the bigger uh, regional uh, organization. So from that, uh, I had to work with different leaders in the medical physics uh, in the region as well as uh, in the whole world. Now, along the way, that's interesting, right? We have done this, we have published in top journals, all the research, but somehow I, I felt we could do something more than that. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi, right, he's one of the writing seven social issues. One of them, science without humanity. So we can't do science, but without thinking of the humanity, how it benefits the human society. And that, well, to him, is a sin, it's a social sin. And it's really doing injustice. And look at the other thing, it's quite interesting, right? very philosophical, and it's true, right? Like commerce without morality, politics without principle. Right? So Gandhi was such a universalist answer. Uh, the man for all seasons. And we still benefit really from his wisdom. Now, when I was appointed as a promoted as a professor, finally, <laughs> many trials, about 16 years ago, and University of Publishing that uh, this at the helm, right, this book, uh, a hard copy book, uh, each professor will say something about him, uh, uh, photograph, his brief biography and also a chance to put out what you believe or your motto and I quoted T.S. Eliot, uh, the very well-known literature giant. Uh, Where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And where is the knowledge we have lost in information? It's from his poem, The Rock. And of course this is just excerpt from that. The whole poem is, is very meaningful and today's age right uh, you see we have so much information on the mobile phone or the AI and all that technology you are flooded with information lots of webinar right, people tell you and we have webinaria a word I call <laughs> we have diarrhea webinaria from attending all those uh, webinars suffering from indigestion so isn't it no, where, where is this knowledge we have? We don't have the wisdom. We look at the world today, right? It's still full of turmoil. Uh, it's really uh, pretty sad to see. Right? And where is the life we've lost in living? Where is the meaning of life? So what would the science contribute to the well-being of the human society? And that really, uh, I put it in, and it is my belief. Uh, until today, I want to do something good. And uh, some of my journeys, I travel a fair bit uh, to teach Zimbabwe. Uh, this is Victoria Fall, my privilege, uh, the side trip. Uh, one of the poorest countries in the world. And I was there, it was the uh, ending part of the uh, famous man, uh, Mugabe, uh, was when he ousted later. I see very poor one of the poorest country, the children, and you notice know, what these people are doing down there? They just didn't have money to buy newspaper. In the morning, I would just walk around from a hotel. 
you just look at it, right? It dare not touch it as well, it touches the back. So just look at the headlines and walk away, right? This is how uh, poor they are. And now this is the, I was uh, under the International Atomic Energy Agency to help them to start the master program. Uh, this is the top university, National University of Science and Technology. Look at the roads in front of the, the main building, like our chancellery. It's not even tar, right? They don't have, it is a uh, mud road. But they were very good people, the students enjoy teaching and uh, some of them are still corresponding with me. And you learn a lot uh, from this a very humble lifestyle, right? And we have in Malaysia and we are much more fortunate materially. I know these people are they're happy. Another country that I also experienced is Nepal. And also under the IAEA mission. And by the way, along my former to teach, to help them to start program, uh, quality assurance program, I also have my uh, another mission, my charity work, which I, my wife have been doing for all years. So I take opportunity to work with the people. But I can see there I was uh, teaching in a hospital, a bunch of uh, doctors and uh, interesting the street. You can see how these two ladies squeeze into the, the van, right? We seldom have that now. And I had the opportunity to go into one of those two just to experience how life is. It is important. You need to go down to the level to understand how people live, how they think, the different culture, to experience that. They will help us to appreciate life better. Right? Don't take things for granted. And Fukushima was another mission under the IA. It's very fortunate to be one of the experts. Uh, we have to form a, a task force to study why they happen to all aspects. So I have a chance to work with a team of people, uh, not only radiation uh, experts, but you have uh, psychology, psychiatrists, and public health, and who look at the consequences of the uh, Fukushima disaster. And the picture on top shows how in the local setting, in the different towns, they were helping them. Uh, they were trying to recover the healing process. It's such a traumatic experience. So many of them were so dedicated. Uh, many of the doctors, the surgeons were working with that voluntarily. And, and I was there for several, uh, almost every year we went there for meeting, for some uh, survey. and. Uh, you see that whole area is called desolated. Uh, this is another thing we have learned a lot uh, from my colleagues in other disciplines. And also uh, really salute the people in Japan. Uh, they've gone through uh, the first you have the atomic bomb, right? Nagasaki, Hiroshima. And now you have another nuclear disaster, the Fukushima. Uh, they've gone through this hardship. But still they're so strong, so resilient, they bounce back. Oh, that led to my uh, so-called recognition. Uh, 2013 was voted as the top 50 medical physicists in the world. Uh, there's a 50 years of the International Organization of Medical Physics uh, Formation, so they awarded the, the top 50. And this is the, the mark shots of those uh, outstanding contribution over 50 years. Right? Uh, it's interesting, I was the one with the uh, circle of the red. And uh, amongst those recipients of that, two uh, Nobel laureates, right? so you can spot them, okay? two of them, uh, contribution in uh, MRI. And, so, and many, really the, the very top uh, physicists in, in the world. Right? So it was uh, such an, uh, an honor and also a very humble experience. Um, to be listed uh, alongside with uh, my colleagues uh, in the world. And then the so-called pinnacle of my academic career came when I was uh, nominated and then I was uh, successful with the recipient of the Marie Stoska Curie Award in uh, 2018. And the conference was held in Prague in Czech Republic then, so my whole family went there and receiving uh, that uh, plaque from the president and the award uh, committee chairperson. So uh, that Marie 
Sadoska Curie Award was not just on research alone. Right? If it's just on the research, no way I can really compete with all the very top, the American European physicists. I think huge amount of grants, all rows of postdocs and that is research, uh, education, and in leadership. Right? The contribution in these three areas. Uh, that was really a uh, award that I didn't quite expect that uh, it bestowed upon me. There's something special about that. Uh, I'm the first uh, from a different country. The previous six of them are all from America, uh, France, Germany, and UK. All these very prestigious, very well known physicists uh, in the world. Uh, from an Asia, uh, from a different country, is something that many of them didn't quite expect that happen. Our ambassador, a Malaysian ambassador, uh, was planning, uh, came to the award ceremony. She came with her secretary and standing uh, beside me on my on my left here. Uh, and then later, uh, it was during Puasa Man, uh, we had uh, breakfast. Uh, Puasa in the residence of the, the ambassador, so it's, and the, my fellow Malaysians there, my family and two grandchildren, uh, my wife and, and daughter. So oh, by the way, my daughter also is an academic at the University of Malay. So that was a very joyous uh, occasion. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, uh, jump a bit. Uh, typical Malaysian style, right? We celebrate our joyful occasions together and with food, uh, <laughs> lots of food. Uh, we brought uh, lemang and all that uh, from Malaysia somehow. We managed to <laughs> pass through the custom and they, the ambassador staff also enjoy uh, about uh, all this real lemang and uh, rendang uh, from Malaysia. So that's a very close. And it's all this we might always be grateful to, to be gratitude people help us. Of course, we, we thank God we are alive, we are healthy, and people who helped us, our family, our friends, even the students, important. Uh, don't forget, right, people help us, like say in the lab, the technicians or whoever helped us when we were student once, and now we are big shots of professors or whatever. Don't forget they help us once. We, we gratitude to them, to, to appreciate, to thank them, and even sending a thank you card, perhaps on the old fashioned, <laughs> still send a card to people, just a simple, and they'll appreciate that. Uh, now we never send any card. Right? It's all WhatsApp and email. Uh, but think about that. And, and count our blessings. And here, a photograph of my uh, of parents who passed away, my father and mother, uh, and the, my daughter. and. Uh, and also my my wife, my so uh, they were also uh, very supportive of my academic career. Uh, without them, I wouldn't be what I'm today. So would be great, grateful always. And finally, that was the uh, Matika Award, as Amira mentioned, the uh, last year uh, for outstanding scholastic achievement. And that is also something that I didn't expect. There's so many uh, great people around Malaysia. Uh, due to the pandemic, the ceremony was kept postponing uh, from last August to December to February. Now, probably we we'll go back to the Medica, which is in August this year, to receive that uh, award uh, from Tuan Ku. And uh, I have a chance to meet up with uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Prof. Dr. Hamdi, and uh, show him that uh, the trophy, uh, the award. Uh, first, I have the uh, an official first before the official ceremony. So that was this uh, very meaningful and it is really uh, achievement to the University of Malaya and I'm thankful. But during the COVID, like most of us are locked down at home, you know, well, really it's frustrating, I right? can't get to, to do our research, you know, teaching for a while and then later go back to e-learning. So uh, it started this uh, Looking at the uh, publications, uh, we have to weekly 
update, and even today, you know, sometimes a bit late, but weekly, we scout all the literature, not only science and but in social science, humanities, public policy, medicine and health, and highlight some of those, giving our comments. Uh, uh, and it, it's in a web page, covid 19 bibliometricsorg And also the Ministry of Health in Malaysia also have uh, link to that and also showing the trend. So I've got uh, some of these people uh, involved uh, from the uh, Computer, Faculty of Computer Science there uh, to uh, help. To, so that is another uh, collaborative effort in this. So the whole idea is to get people aware what are the latest findings from uh, the journals. These are credible journals in a way to fight uh, against this misinformation and disinformation, the fake news is so prevalent today. Another project was working okay, with uh, Prof. Uh, Madhya uh, Narizo Adi, thinking to get together. Uh, he was one of my best students ever. Uh, thinking of this, developing the uh, thermometer, we call it Sauna 32. I right? don't know why you, this is a low tech, but uh, not just fulfill the, the shortage then, but of course there's plenty full, but really to develop something local. I got his uh, colleague engineer to help us and eventually we have more features we want to teach school children how to make it himself. Right? It's a way to promote STEM. Right? You go to the school and you 3D printing the, the shell, the casing and the different put the components together and test it. And then we really want to all this to donate to the uh, HK homes, um, to the orphan homes and so on. And so that is a project that we started. Of course, all this will not result in uh, publications in WOS tier 1 or tier 2. But anyway, they are meaningful, uh, impactful uh, result. Right? It will have impact to the society. So find the last few parting words about adaptable. Uh, it's important to notice or I described the early beginning, the various challenges, set up master program and uh, many more. But one thing learned from the Charles Darwin uh, is not how strong we are, but is or how intelligent, but adaptable to change. The change is important uh, to the circumstances. And I wrote this uh, a tutorial for my professional uh, magazine uh, last year. Right? Uh, as we usher in 2020, are we still relevant? Relevant to what we do. Uh, this is uh, modified from this, uh, you know, the story about who moved my cheese. Right? Instead of going around the maze, and why not think out of the box, like get out and look far. Oh, oh there's a cheese, no one knew, but instead of going for the rotten cheese, uh, fighting with each other. And that is an important message I like to convey. Um, to my students and to my colleagues as well. So beside this research, very academic thing, you're very serious researchers and lecturers, but you are more than that, time for creativity, and that is important for drawing, singing, writing, knitting, or, or baking. How many I, my colleagues, they during the pandemic, they learned to be good cooks. Uh, so lose ourselves in something creative to find inner calm. And this is important. Most of us are under stress. Students, lecturers, and people, and all this second way, third way. We are all so stressed up, so worried. So we need to look for something for inner calm. And this is important. And who knows, we come up with solutions to various problems. And there is interesting quote, just from The Guardian, from Sharon Walker. January this year. I really like it. And this is what uh, I believe in and I practice. And you will see me some jogging around the University Lake. Uh, and I indulge in writing, not so much of academic. Look at those. I was in my first book in 1985, a long time ago, in Malay. Pengatu eh? Choran Computer. Logo was the first. Uh, so called AI language uh, is interesting. LOGO logo, and that was Apple logo. Apple computer just appeared. And I was involved in the Kamus Vibahasa computer, right? 
uh, with two colleagues uh, as well. Uh, so this is my, my indulgence in, in writing, my hobbies, and uh, this uh, first picture book of computer in English, uh, in Mandarin as well. Uh, oh, there was a big hit then, uh, the first uh, new computer was new uh, those days. Uh, so I, I enjoy uh, getting a lot of ideas from working with children. The great, uh, their minds are not ruined, not uh, spoiled. As. So, what are uh, so my main message to the young Malaysians? Uh, uh, put that in the Medica Award uh, souvenir book. Set your eyes on your aspirations and be courageous. Even if the path is turbulent, adapt to changes, but always be a person of integrity. Wow, you can see. So, so of course, you aspire right, to do something like the curse Sarah Sarah, what will be, will be. What do you want to aspire? You want to be a leader, you want to be a successful banker, go for that right? and be courageous. And remember, it's never a smooth path, right? it's always turbulent. Turn, maybe obstacles, you fall in the hole and get up and change. It's the world is changing so fast, you right? have to adapt and don't forget integrity is important. And this also I put in the medical award, so we need a book of my personal philosophy. Right? They uh, allowed that uh, organizer, to each recipient to put it. So my humility, gratitude and charity, and probably you can see this uh, throughout my life journey, uh, the adult life journey in the Kadir uh, to various extent, uh, you might see some of those, but uh, I'm still uh, lacking in some of it. It's a continuous journey, a continuous uh, improvement. And it's very much of my uh, philosophy and the leadership style influenced by the St. Augustine, Humility is the foundation of all the other virtues. Really, you have all the virtues being kind, being empathy, but you would you know, the humility, then the foundation will not be there, it will be shaking. So finally, uh, leave behind with you my quotation. I would like people to remember me for this, to achieve more we should imagine together and change. Right? The change is important. It's so much so there are a lot of seminars, books about change leadership, the change, but make a difference is important. Whatever you do, make a difference to make life better for other people and also make life always to be happy. Right? This is important to be happy. I, oh yeah, just remember, some of these things come into my mind now. Uh, the saying I read uh, long ago so, yeah, in the university days, uh, what is life there is if there's no time to stand and stare, right? Isn't it? Are we too engrossed in chasing whatever we are after, then no time to just stand and stare, look around, talk to people, uh, chat with people. Right? But you still need to get back to the, the, the meaning of life. Right? So with that, I thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Prof. Un, for sharing your tale and your journey mm -hmm. and um, really for giving us inspiration and I think a little bit of outlook on how you actually became an academic leader. I'm going to now um, stop sharing and then we can have a nice <laughs> conversation. Okay. So, okay, there we go. So. Um, Prof, I have some questions that I would like to ask. So many, actually, it's all oh. over the place now. Okay. <laughs> but uh, just to let everybody know that if you would like to jump in, if you'd like to also talk to uh, Prof Ng, uh, please feel free to either raise your hand um, in the MS Teams, of course, uh, use the hand raised function. Or if you are unable to get our attention for that, um, feel free as well to um, go ahead and unmute and go ahead and speak. Um, and at the same time, if you do not have 
a microphone uh, and you would like to ask a question or leave a comment, feel free as well to type into the uh, chat box. I'm actually taking a look at it right now so I can see a few thank yous coming in to your oh, browse. Okay, so okay. we've got somebody saying thank you. Um, they're very honored to be able to attend the talk. Um, and also, uh, we have a message saying that it's a very inspiring and meaningful talk. Uh, and again, another one saying such an inspiring talk. And we actually have our first question, so I will let uh, Prof. Ang Pei Su's question go first before I uh, ask my questions. So, um, Prof, we would like to know, you know, someone who is so busy, well, I would assume somebody who is very busy because you're doing so many projects and you are, of course, collaborating with so many people and doing so many things as well as an academic. Um, can you share with us, uh, this is a question from uh, Prof. Ong Pois, uh, from Paisu. What's your typical day like? Oh. Well, because of this collaboration right, from one end of the earth to the other, so my day is a bit long. Sometimes I have to get up quite early morning to catch the conversation with the other side of the world before they go to sleep. Or I, I quite, for example, I've been uh, following the WHO, the DGs, briefing on the COVID-19. So that's about 1 a.m. So I just stay up. Uh, that, what's the latest? Now that, the downside is well, it, it ruin your health to some extent. So remember I said sacrifice all that. Uh, it's difficult. It depends how much you're willing to sacrifice. I hope comes some balance. Uh, it is important about this the busy. I believe a lot in time management. Uh, I took a course, a professional course, a very good on time management. I invested a lot of those and to learn and to work with this colleague, you need to build up the trust is important and to be very frank with them. Right? Or communicate with them either phone call, uh, television, I mean, teleconferencing, or email. And once you build up the trust and we identify our common goal, what we want to do, it will be easier. Otherwise, uh, we land up with you know, the team members who argue with each other, the controversy, who should be the first author. So that has happened before. So uh, it is really part of uh, this collaborative efforts. We have mostly uh, successful, enjoyable, but we do have some which is uh, really uh, didn't work out well. So what do you do, Prof, um, to bounce back from from those efforts that maybe didn't work out so well? Uh, I try. I mean, I, I'm a pretty patient person, a lot of drivability in that uh, contact them. Most of the time, phone call is effective to explain because I deal with people from different culture and different ways of working. Even what we understand each other uh, to them is a different meaning. We try to uh, recover or rebuild the relationship. It's very important. It's a two-way conversation to both my shake hand. Uh, many of them do work out well to restart program but some dean we just say uh, bye bye and happily <laughs> peacefully. Yeah. What bygones be bygones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Prof, um, you know, you, you're a medical physicist yeah. and um, you know, you work in biomedical imaging. So I imagine these are things that, you know, you don't really get in touch with the person, the patient in front of you so much, I, I imagine. Yeah. But how is it coming from this very, from this, you know, um, from this field where you don't really need to meet people in a sense, how are you coming from, you know, medical physicist um, and medical physics and biomedical imaging, how do you come from there and cultivate such humanity? Because throughout your entire talk, and I'm sure all of you have noticed it as well, I just see the element of humanity in almost every single slide. Uh, Amira, it's an interesting question. But my interest go in life is to do good for human society. 
And one thing about using like CT scan, X-ray, right? the X-ray is as some element of hazard. So by training, teaching the radiologists, radiographers properly, they will ensure patient safety. And uh, my motivation is that if we can do the research well to train them so that the image they get will be of the so-called optimal quality. They can make an accurate diagnosis. They won't miss the cancer there. So that is, is important. Knowing that it's just not doing technically play around with knobs, right? Thinking how this will impact on the patient. Imagine uh, the patient received done the mammogram and oh no cancer, yeah, normal. But then it's there, but the actually failed to pick up that cancer. So she went back thinking, but then the cancer will grow and then be too late with the misdiagnosis. So if with this, I always uh, tell my student that this is how we should think. Uh, we might do technical thing research, but eventually it has impact on the patient's life, patient's well-being. And that is this. And then I thinking, oh, besides the this research, you, know, you have done this, you've done that, you're publishing very top journal, but it's good to beyond that. Uh, for example, by the Fukushima project was it IAEA that was very meaningful. I work with different people. We go to the, the ground level, we see the people uh, and see how they live, the fear. Because I work uh, with a bunch of social scientists, psychologists, uh, historians. It's quite interesting to learn from. We work together as a team, uh, how we contribute our different specialty uh, to produce a report uh, to suggest the recommendation to the Japanese government, to the people there. And this is how uh, I see uh, the science goes beyond just science, right? but it goes to work with the, the non-science people, the social science, humanity, and to benefit all. And this is the way to go, uh, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach. And this is where the University of Malaya and many leading initiatives in the world are heading to a more impactful study. And you've actually been doing this actually for, from the very beginning almost, right? Yes. <laughs> Except that there wasn't much recognition. People will wonder, did you tell a story, although this is a tale, right? Uh, I once doing Rosalyn, I was doing okay, linguistic, I got some grant. My interest also in this mobile phone radiation, right? People are worried about the, from the mobile phone station and all that. On the so people's perception of the risk, how to communicate the risk. Uh, so when the linguistic and social science people uh, tend to look at me, hey, who is this? Like I'm an alien coming over here. What? You are from medicine? Why don't you come over to my faculty? So we still have that barrier, right? Uh, very well defined. Oh, I'm social science. I'm engineering. I'm medicine. <laughs> it's interesting. You know? They sort of look at me. Pretty suspicious, like a spy. <laughs> anyway, that is a very difficult. Even trying to, I'm the co supervisor of uh, she registered for a PhD in linguistic. Also, quite difficult. Took a year uh, to convince them I, I could be a co supervisor. Because the, the fault with me is I don't have an MA. Uh, I, I don't have an MA, so I, therefore I can't. So those, those were the thinking then. It's interesting. But now it's totally different, right? We just cross so often when you find people doing and that is interesting. So that was part of my so-called frustration then, right? And uh, Rosalind now, she's a lecturer in Xiamen University. She was a tailor, uh, doing well. So we look back, we can laugh away. <laughs> Yeah. Prof, I want to ask you a little bit later on about your mentees, the many people that you've mentored, but first let me go back to some okay. of the questions that we have here. So uh, we have one question here. This is about the um, international mentoring program. So the question is when did it start and what are the main activities delivered and how do you rate the impact of that international mentoring program? It started about uh, five years ago, right, uh, quite informally. Uh, we didn't have a, we went today, we have a proper structure, we didn't have a board of directors or anything. It's basically me and a few who uh, were conned by me to join me or persuaded them. They were very good uh, from Australia, from the US. 
and now others come. There are some are guest mentors as well. So most time we do is what uh, is the mentoring in the session, very much the dialogue we use <coughs> Zoom or yeah, one of those uh, meetings. Uh, then we have various like mini projects, something a group together to write some papers. And a group of them very good and led by the Latin American students uh, on women in physics. So we publish that in, in the journal and uh, to, to part in conference presentations and others as well. So uh, eventually it's empower them. Uh, uh, Both time in now is left their own to organize, to invite uh, guest speakers, guest mentors. And also in the technical field, I say they're doing research. Uh, one of them is on radiation dose measurement and should assess to those mentors and the mentor can in turn recommend the expert from the field to help them. So these are all uh, benefits of that. But most important thing, uh, all you can see like a melting pot. I can see all in the, our Asian students from Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and then the Latin America. You see that they behave differently. They different. Uh, chemistry, different psychology. Right? Uh, but anyway, they now understand it is good, right? East meets West. The, the dialogue, the cultural dialogue is important. I see, I'm really happy with that. They understand each other's culture uh, much, much better. And there are, in fact, a lot more uh, joining us. So it's rather informal. There's no fees to pay, no registration fees or whatever it is. Uh, one, two, three to leave. But it's quite interesting after that, the original 16 or so still remain. Uh, some are more active than others. It's good. Uh, one question about how to assess. Basically, well, uh, I answer that, right? The fact that they remain and they participate and they recommend their friends to join. And I see that uh, some of them, some are student, master, PhD. Some just graduate looking for jobs, some are doing postdoc, so different. So they exchange news, they support each other, and, and that is, is very good. Uh, and I hope that this serves as a model for other disciplines, uh, for engineering or for humanity to, to start that. that. That would be excellent. But hope that. In the old, before the pandemic sets in the lockdown, we met them in conferences like was in Brazil or Kuala Lumpur, Indonesia. So we have a good chance to share, to have love uh, over a meal or drink. That, that is wonderful. You were saying earlier, Prof, before we actually came online for this webinar, that it's actually so much nicer if we could have a physical kind of meeting. So I guess that phase very much into how you develop your relationships with your mentees, that you meet up with them, as you say, you go out for drinks and maka maka and... Yeah, exactly. the relationship is important. It's all this, you see, my collaboration, all this is about relationship. It's so important. About relationship, you have to trust it's important because you've proven that all this, there are people of high integrity. Uh, we are doing respectable, ethical research publications. But along the way, you have more relationship, become friends, you know their families. And I mean, I've known them uh, for a long time in conferences, or I visit them and I travel. But that is very important. The belief is uh, must be emphasized because as you go along, becoming so IT dependent, everything is so distant, so emotionless. Instead of using so called human intelligence, we let artificial intelligence take over us. So that would devoid any of this. So the, the human, as T.S. Eliot said, I really love that poem, right? What is this life we lost? Right? We have all information on the phone, everything in there, but you look at the life, right? life meaningful, satisfying. It's good to think about that. Prof, would you say that, you know, it's this mindset that you have. Is that possibly perhaps something, some elements that actually help to make you what you are today, help you to be the top 50 medical physicists in the world, help you to win a very prestigious um, Mary Skłodowska Curie Award and of course the Merdeka Award 
you know, on top of all your 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 scientific contributions? Uh, first, uh, I didn't aim for those. I, I never I want to win this and that. Never in my mind. It's better that way. It comes as a surprise. Huh? It comes, it's going, it doesn't, so you don't have that kind of expectation. So your life wouldn't be so miserable for that. Uh, I told a lot of people, it's not like entering a competition to win. That was uh, an honor. Huh? It's nominated and they were awarded with that. So I look at that way. Uh, it's important. Also, what we want to do is very much our choice. Huh? We have a lot of abilities. Huh? Uh, so many great people around, top scientists, you know, but what one is a choice. I remember, I used to watch Harry Potter. Do you watch uh, Harry Potter? Just the first one. So, so, <laughs> so, you know, my grandchildren, right? There's this uh, Dumbledore, the, the great guru, uh, talking to Harry Potter. Or it's, it's, about, yeah, it's, it's about your choices. It is not about your ability. That is what makes uh, so always have great abilities to do things, but it's our choice what we want to do in our life. But I happen to grow up, I mean, it's to, to try and error or ups and downs. It's very much a service orientated to the give, to help people. Uh, it's very much ingrained in me and, and my wife, family too. So it's not so much of a like, calculative of a do this or something return. So in that way, like people, come to me to get advice, I will freely give them or direct them to wherever it is. Um, so that is how I see myself uh, in that direction, the, the service, the, the giving. That's, it's very humbling to hear that, Prof, because um, in this day and age, you know, as we are chasing whatever that we need to chase, you know, as we chase KPIs, as we chase, um, I suppose, uh, positions, um, as we chase numbers. At the end of the day, though, as, as you just shared, it's actually um, more about the service at the end of that. Yeah, it's service to us humankind. Uh, you brought a point, it's good, I missed that out. I was fortunate though when I started on my academic career, right? Uh, it wasn't fortunate like many of got sent to the PhD, come back, become a lecturer, but I didn't come from that route. So it's scientific professor, I was a tutor and then work elsewhere and come back. Uh, early days, we have no KPI. There's no how many paper, there's no WOSRS. <laughs> so you do what you want. And also early days, there's also no research grant. It's unheard of to have RA. Okay, now I envy the young ones that they have granted employed RA. Yeah, we did everything ourselves. Everything. We wash test tubes, we do cut things, we carry things. And uh, also, it's a good as well, right? Those who are motivated, they can do more. This is, you need to tell you, you how many papers and uh, impact factors non existent those days. So that was, in a way, fortunate. Today, I pity those <laughs> struggle for this KPI, the meter quota. Well, Prof, for the younger academics um, today, those who aspire to achieve academic leadership as you have, you know, being somebody who is um, a, a leader in your field, somebody that mentors others, what would your advice be to charting their academic destiny? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this number door to Harry Potter, right? Uh, is your choice. If you want, you must prepare. Uh, I show the path is not that smooth, it is challenging, obstacles, so you must prepare for that. It's a long haul, not one or two years. And that is, if you set your heart to that, just go for that, as my chemistry teacher told, right? just excel in whatever you do. Not, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you have everyone to be an academic leader. Uh, you can be a leader in other fields as well. One can be a very good uh, institutional leader, or organization, a different way. We see a lot of leaders, even amongst the administrative staff as well, very good in that. So we must see it that way. Unfortunately, the world we see leader as someone with all the degrees, all the titles, and a lot of money as well, wealth and all that. 
uh, it will not necessarily mean that way. And even in the NGOs, we see a lot of great leaders who sacrifice their time, the resource to help the, the poor people or the uh, marginalized people. These are leaders as well. So we need to learn from these people. I've uh, been in the academic leaders. Uh, doesn't mean we are tied up on top of the pedestal, but we also need to go down. That's why I enjoy the travel. Like, it's the Nepal. I say, you know, I really stay with the people. Very see how they live the condition. Really think to realize, oh, this is how they live, how they struggle. Lest I forget, you know, we take things for granted. That is a very very important. Very important thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Prof, I um I have another question again about you know the idea of leadership and the people that you've mentored. But before that, um, I'll turn to another question that we have here. Um, we'd like to know, Prof, uh, how do we balance time between research and going into industry for consultation? Uh, I in my early part I did quite a bit of uh, consultation. Uh, with this quality assurance, uh, but now less so. It's difficult to say that the balance is all depend on what you want. But I know in some disciplines, the industrial discipline is very important, like those in engineering, uh, computer science. So you need to work with the industry. Imagine you are just the university is normally referred to as ivory tower. You just focus and and not really what's happening in the real world. So that is important. You can spend more time, and now university recognizes more, right? The university industrial uh, linkage, and the top universities in the world in U.S., uh, in China, and Singapore all have very strong linkage. The industry provide funding, the opportunity. So that is important. As to the balance percentage, uh, it's up to your. Uh, decision and your discipline, how you want to shape your own future. For you yourself, Prof, um, how have you balanced that research oh. and going out, I suppose, um, to society? Uh, I now have uh, a bit more freedom, uh, more time to, with the society. So, a lot of work I, I do is more, I, I don't really quite bothered with cake and all this, more than enough, but I enjoy that like, I begin to collaborate with uh, social science department, uh, with others, uh, to look at things that is beyond, like, look at the history and uh, science technology society. So I'm not so dictated by my mainstream, my work, so I can expand on that. So I begin to spend quite a bit of time, probably more than half on that, and starting various uh, collaborating research with those people, uh, writing another book, or uh, also I'm quite interested to go back to uh, books for children and different things. So I, uh, it's good to be in academia. So we have a bit of freedom. We, we indulge in our hobbies. Remember it says, right? We are being paid to what we enjoy doing. I know some of the great academic leaders, they are great. They, they start to Learn how to draw, painting, singing, dancing. I was very intrigued, Prof, when you showed those books that you wrote. <laughs> they are so um, accessible, and they're um, they're so accessible and you know easy to read, and it's not <laughs> academic. Um, I'm just wondering, Prof, you know what what interested you to go and to write books like that? Uh, I from young interest in, in drawing, a lot of sketching, drawing, but so it, it's all driven by more interest than anything else. But those things don't count, by the way, for the, our CV, right? This is something extracurricular to call. And in the early days, people frown on me. Why are you a lecturer in the medical field? You're doing this. <laughs> well, I guess that is me. And, that, uh, and today, this won't happen, right? In fact, we encourage. Uh, what is called the the blue sky, a blue ocean, the open sky, right? You just the sky is the limit of what you want as long as you enjoy doing and you have some benefit to society. 
And I know I amazed I met someone who is a lecturer. He said, Oh, Prof, when I was young, I read your book. <laughs> oh, that is so sweet. <laughs> I was totally shocked. Oh, yeah. They say the mother still keep those books. <laughs> How do you feel when somebody comes and tells you that? Oh, really, it is so satisfying. It's just unbelievable. And that is uh, the good things about it. Mm. You can't explain the kind of joy we have. These people thank you. I, I wish to up, uh, upgrade the Kamus Vibhasa that is needed. Hopefully it will convince uh, yeah, some people to join me. That would be very useful. I think schools and, and, yes, and children would be, and teachers definitely would yes. be very, very grateful and appreciative of something like that because it's hard, I think, to find yes. a really good resource like that now. Mm. Um, Prof, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that this, you know, those things that you do, it actually brings you joy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about, uh, I, I imagine you probably find a lot of joy in mentoring others because you have mentored so many. So I wanted to know, you know, how did you kind of like fall into becoming a mentor? What was your first or early mentorship um, experience? Uh, uh, first, I have good mentors like Prof. Louis and Prof. Cameron. So I benefit from them. And I make it a point that I really want to continue with this tradition or legacy to mentor others. And the, the joy, the happiness, you really have to experience yourself. Like if I see some of my the mentees, they're doing well, uh, publish a new paper or be successful in grant, and you share the joy with them, and that uh, is just wonderful. Uh, many of them is good. They send me a note, uh, they call me and explain or share with me. And for some of them, like one. Uh, she's been a lot of mental distress now, almost burnout, and she's been texting me quite a lot. <laughs> uh, as a young young girl, uh, so we do what we can to support. And I think the university is a support system to support our students, even our junior colleagues. It's so important. It's a support system it's needed to mentor them, to yourself as a guide. You are a cheerleader. You lend your shoulder someone to cry upon, <laughs> whatever it is. Prof, I think so many, uh, I'm sure, are very, very grateful to have been mentored by you. I myself am a very humbled and honored that I actually get to sit and speak with you today in this very, very humble <laughs> setting that we have. Yeah. So, Prof, um, thank you so very much for spending your time to actually come to ADAC uh, and speak and do this webinar for the UM community. We really appreciate it. And before we say goodbye to everybody, um, would you have any um, important parting messages that you would like to share? Uh, thank you, first of all, for enduring that one and a half hours listening to me, uh, telling story, a tale of academic leadership right from uh, Ng Kwan Hong. I hope that some of these points I remember I, uh, from Gandhi, from uh, St. Asbury, about the yeah, enabling like this. You need to constantly think upon and how this inspired and move us to action. And this is so important. And all the more now with this uh, COVID 19 pandemic, and this isn't going away quite soon. We really need that. To, to strengthen ourselves, to build up. So, yeah, that, some of this is really not really necessary to build up to an, a leadership in academia, but also could be leadership in other aspects in your professional life as well. So, do hope that uh, you benefited from some of uh, my personal experiences and some of the uh, principles that I live by. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Please be sure to fill up the feedback form. I think somebody will soon share it in the meeting chat. But in the meantime, thank you. And we really hope that this wonderful tale that Prof. Eun has shared with us would inspire and motivate all of us, me included, to start our own tale in academia. Thank you so much again, Prof. OK, thank you, Dr. Mira. Good job. And thank you all. Bye-bye. And. Uh, have a good week and and be safe. Thank you, Prof. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye. -bye.